was in a typhoon. Because what's really happening is that you're hiding something out there. Привет, Москва! Привет, будущие! Свободные люди! Фантастика! Когда я организовывал это мероприятие, мне в голову не могло прийти, что на философскую лекцию возможно собрать полторы тысячи человек. Это что-то беспрецедентное не только для России, это что-то беспрецедентное для мира. И когда мне рассказывают, что вот в России люди не готовы к свободе, ну я просто хохочу, потому что очевидно совершенно это не так. Очевидно, именно в России люди больше всего готовы к свободе. Когда я завел свой YouTube-канал, я завел его с определенной целью. Я мечтал поговорить со своими кумирами, с кумирами, которые ну, помогли мне стать интеллектуально, и кумирами, с которыми я разочаровался. То есть вот с людьми, которые были очень важной частью моего взросления. И я счастлив, что сегодня мне доступно говорить не только с кумирами из моей собственной страны, но и с кумирами из-за границы. Вот я привез Ганса Германа Хопе, это один из самых ярких философов либертарианства, автор скандальной книги и нашумевшей книги «Демократия. Неизверженный Бог», один из последователей Мюра Ротборда, Ротборда, который является основополаг... основоположником современного либертарианства, того, что мы сегодня называем ли... либертарианством. И когда я читаю свои лекции по всей стране, я, как в известной цитате, стою на плечах титанов. И я невероятно горд, что мне удалось познакомиться с одним из этих титанов, который оказал лично на меня очень большое влияние. Сегодня он будет выступать на сцене. Одно из главных достижений Ганса Германа Хоппе заключается в том, что он ярче всех понял, что либертарианство — это в первую очередь политическая доктрина. Это правовая доктрина. Совершенно неважно, каких культурных ценностей вы придерживаетесь. Если вы, испов... если вы проповедуете договор о неагрессии, основополагающий принцип либертарианства, то вы являетесь либертарианцем. И когда он это проговорил, когда он начал защищать людей, консервативных взглядов от нападок тех, кого сегодня называют левыми либертарианцами, левыми либертариями, он стал гоним из либертарианской среды, гоним большим капиталом. И кто поинтересуется историей раскола института Катона, института Мизоса, почитайте, как большие деньги на Западе коррумпировали либертарианство, как они коррумпировали либертарианское движение, как это стало возможно благодаря деньгам очень богатых людей, как это произошло с либерализмом в России в свое время. И одна из причин, почему я хотел организовать именно эту лекцию, и почему я настолько счастлив, что сегодня у вас здесь собралось такое огромное количество, я хотел бы, чтобы вы поняли, что либертарианство защищают не богатых против бедных, что либертарианцы защищают не консерваторов от либералов а, и не либералов от консерваторов. Мы защищаем всех, кто готов отказаться от агрессивного насилия. Мы делим людей по методам, а не по целям. Нам все равно, какие цели вы преследуете. Нам важно, какие методы вы используете для того, чтобы их достигать. И в этом смысле не существует токсичной культурной повестки, не существует токсичных взглядов, не существует взглядов, как, существуют взгляды, которые мы имеем право порицать, но не существуют взгляды, которые, э, которые государство бы имело право, э, имело право дискриминировать против которых. Э, и через минуту на эту сцену выйдет э, Ганс Герман Хоппе, расскажет, почему демократия э, приводит к эрозии гражданского общества, почему только децентрализация, почему только с помощью децентрализации э, власти возможно сохранить свободу человека. Он объяснит, почему свобода ассоциации не бывает без свободы не ассоциироваться, почему свобода бывает только там, где человек волен проводить границы. Потому что мир без границ — это мир, в котором некуда бежать. Спасибо большое. На сцену приглашаю Ганса Германа Хоппе.
your mic. This is your water. Thank you very much. I'm impressed <laughs> by the number of people showing up for this. Um, um, I hope I will give you a, a good, entertaining, intellectual show, uh, which is not an easy task. Um, but given the size of the audience, I, it would be a, a big blow to myself mm -hmm. uh, if I wouldn't be able to entertain you at least uh, decently well. So again, thank you very much. Um, and um, the title that I have chosen for this, this speech um, is uh, historical patterns and tendencies in Austro-Libertarian perspective. That is, I want to tell you a few stories, so to speak, um, that explain the present world. Um, and the story consists of three sub-stories they are all interconnected, uh, run in a way parallel, um, but I will present them, of course, in a, in a sequence. First one, then the second, then the third, and they will complement each other to come up with a full picture that makes you hopefully better understand the present world. The first story, or nowadays people call that the first narrative, um, concerns the origin of states and the changes uh, of states or the constitutions of states in the course of time. It is like a historical reconstruction. And the second story, uh, concerns the concentration of states, deals with the issues of war and imperialism. And um, the third story that then completes the full picture deals with money and banking and monetary centralization. So let me begin with um, the first, I will read you one page from one of my works that explains the very foundations of, um, of libertarianism, the very principles of libertarianism, and then I will, in a more loose way, continue from, from there. If there were no scarcity in this world, um, there would be no conflicts among people. But there is scarcity. Since we left the Garden of Eden, things are scarce. And because things are scarce, we might fight over things. I want to do one thing with a certain object and you might want to do something else with the same object. So if we want to live in peace with each other, it is necessary that all scarce things are in the hands of separate individuals. That is, we need private property in order to avoid conflicts such that I own certain things and I can do what I want with those things. And you own other things and you do whatever you want to do with those things. 
This is the only solution in order to avoid conflict unless there would exist a perfect harmony of all interests. It is everybody wants everybody else to do exactly what he expects them to do. But obviously we do not live in such a world. In a world where we have different ideas of what should be done, what makes us happy or unhappy, we need private property in order to do what we want without coming into conflict with other people. And then the question is, yeah, how do we decide who owns what and who doesn't own what? And the libertarian answer to this is, the first thing is, of course, everybody is the owner of his or her own physical body. You can do with your body what you want. I can do with my body what, you, what I want. I don't interfere with your body and you don't interfere with mine. With regard to external things, in order not to get into conflict, the rule to acquire property, private property, is he who is the very first one to appropriate something that was previously unowned becomes the owner of it. Because only the first one can obviously appropriate these things without running into conflict. The second one cannot do that. If it is already appropriated by one, then the second one, if he wants to appropriate the same things, would run into conflict. And then, of course, property can be passed on by voluntary agreements. I can pass on what I have originally appropriated to you and you can pass on whatever you have appropriated to, um, to, the, next, to the next person. Those are very simple rules, um, intuitively sensible, um, and that is, by and large, the libertarian program. That's how we acquire private property, and that's how we can avoid conflicts. Even if we follow these rules by and large, we have, of course, people who break the rules. People who steal property or do not rely on me passing property on to them, but take it without my consent. So what do we do about rule breakers? And as long as mankind is what it is, we will have rule breakers. Who decides when rules are broken, these rules are broken, who is right and wrong? Who becomes the judge, the arbiter? Now imagine that somebody would propose, oh, I have the solution how we solve this problem. In every case of conflict, including conflicts involving myself, I am the one to decide who is right and who is wrong. Would I have any chance that anybody would accept this rule? And I would, I would guess that nobody would ever accept a rule like this because everybody would know what will happen then. If that were the rule, that meant basically I could initiate a conflict with you, I could steal something from you, I could hit you on the head if I want to, and then you complain about this, why did you steal something from me, why did you hit me on the head? And I would say, yeah, I'm the one who is the ultimate decision maker in this case. And that was, of course, entirely justified that I did this. So obviously, such a rule would be considered to be ridiculous. Now, you realize, of course, 
that this is precisely what states everywhere in the world do. That is, they can initiate a conflict, they can expropriate you, they can break these simple rules that I initially explained, and then if you complain about it, who decides who is right and wrong? A judge who is an employee of the state. So the question is then, how did such a crazy institution such as a state become possible? Something that on the face of it makes no sense whatsoever. And I want to just reconstruct how such a thing was possible. Initially, during the period of the Middle Ages or so, people went with their conflicts that they had with each other to what we might call aristocrats or nobles. You would not choose as judges somebody who has no influence, who is not respected by the rest of the people because ultimately you have to enforce the verdict that the judge makes. And only if you have prominent, successful people that are respected by the public will you be able that your verdict will also be enforced, that people accept this is the right judgment and this is the way we solve this problem. And there was not just one person or one institution to which you could go for the resolution of your conflicts, but there were several ones, several prominent people, aristocrats, whatever, people with great respect from which you could choose. And there was nobody who was the ultimate judge, even if you had a judge that made such and such a decision, his word was not the final and last word. You could always go to somebody else. And everybody, all judges, were considered to be under the same law. Nobody had a monopoly position in this. You could, could always go higher. You could go to the king, you could go appeal to the Pope, uh, and even the Pope was not the ultimate decision maker because Popes uh, could also lose their position. So there was competition in the job of being judges to decide how conflicts should be, should be handled. A big step then occurred and the most decisive step occurred when one of these voluntarily chosen judges competing for respect against other judges elevated himself to the position of being the monopoly judge. My word is the final word and there is no appeal beyond my decision. Nobody is above me my decision is the final decision, and that is it. This we would call an absolute king. He eliminates all his potential competitors, all the other nobles, uh, judges, that you could previously appeal to if you were not happy with the first decision as it was made. How did they get away with that? On the one hand, they got away with it by bribing some of the other of their judge competing judges by saying, okay, I'll I'll give you a subordinate position in my court. And the other thing that they said is talking to the people, the 
general public and saying, look, you might have certain obligations and contracts with other people uh, that you regret that you did them and I will uh, free you of these obligations. And so they got public support for this move of competing judges to a situation where you had one monopoly judge. Historically, this process took several hundred years. Um, it started in the late 16th and early 17th century where states were formed. Well, previously there existed no such thing as a state. There existed competing centers of authority, but no ultimate authority. So several hundred years were necessary for some people to reach this position as ultimate judge. Now, and then you have two institutions that emerged as soon as you had reached this position. The first institution was, now all of a sudden taxes are imposed on people. Previously, even the richest nobles and so forth had to ask their underlings to agree to taxes. And if they didn't agree to it, there were no taxes. Now, however, since you are the monopolist, you can say, okay, you owe me such and such. And if people protested, they said, look, I'm the ultimate judge. And I tell you, you owe me this, that's it. And if you don't do what I tell you, you will be punished for it. And the second thing that happened is, for the first time, we had then something that we call legislation. Prior to this, laws were not made. Laws were considered something that are discovered and apply to everyone in exactly the same way. These laws that I mentioned at the very beginning, how property is established. These were not laws that were made up by somebody. These are natural, natural laws. Natural in the sense, if you want to avoid conflict, then these are the natural laws. They cannot be any different, otherwise you will run into conflict. But now you have, with absolute kings established, you have a situation where you can make laws, invent laws. You must do such and such. You have to have such and such obligation. So taxation and legislation come into existence. First, of course, to a small extent, there won't be not massive taxation and there will not be massive amount of legislation, but slowly, slowly taxation will start and taxes will be increased and slowly, slowly laws will be made. And of course the laws will always be made in such a way that they benefit the ruler and his entourage that he assembles um, around him. And then the next step in the development, bringing us closer to the present time, is now, of course, the position of the king is attacked by various people, mostly by the intellectuals. They say, yeah, but isn't that a violation of the principle of equality before the law if there is one guy, the king, that can make laws? Isn't he a privileged person? Are there now not two types of laws? The laws that apply to regular people um, and the laws that apply to the king. He is above the law that applies to regular people. And that has to go. That is, 
a violation of the principles of justice. And what was the answer to this? The answer to that was to say what we have to do is we have to make it possible that everybody can become the king. That is, we introduce democracy. Um, the, not just the king should have this right to do that. Everybody should have the right to do this. Everybody should be able to become the king, so to speak. The question, however, is, did this step involve that all people did become equal before the law? And the answer is no, of course not. A democratically elected president or prime minister or whatever the name is of these people, he can do the same thing as a king could do before. There is two types of laws still exist. One type of law is what we call private law that applies to everybody in their private dealings. And the other type of law, which we would not even call law, is what, we, what is termed public law. Public law is the law that protects and applies to people who have been democratically elected to be the head of the head of the state. So two types of laws exist under democracy just as much as two types of laws existed under an absolute king. Now what does this what did this change from monarchy to democracy imply. And again, indicating roughly how that was, when that happened historically, uh, the beginning of this process is with the French Revolution, um, where monarchy is first, so to speak, come under heavy attack. And the end process is at least as far as Western Europe is concerned, is the end of World War I when essentially all monarchies are abolished and democracy becomes the, the principle of organization for all Western, Western societies. Now, what this transition means is the following. Somebody, like the king, who considers his country, his, his private property, and all the people living there as his tenants, is replaced by a temporary administrator. The king could sell part of his realm and he could pass it on to future generations. He had what we might call a low time preference because of this. That is, a long planning horizon, precisely because he considered himself as, I'm some sort of owner of this whole thing. A democratically elected politician in charge of the state is not, does not consider himself to be the owner of the place, but a temporary administrator of it. He cannot sell anything and keep the receipts from the sale for himself, and he cannot pass it on to the next generation. Will that make a difference in, way, in the way that he conducts his business? And the answer is, yes, that will make a tremendous difference. I always try to explain that to my students by giving him the following example. Imagine that you own a house. 
you can pass it on as an inher inheritance, uh, you can sell the house, and so forth. Or you have the same house, and for four years you can do with the house whatever you want to do with the house, but you cannot pass it on, and you cannot sell it and keep the receipts from the sale. Will you treat the house the same way? And the answer is, no, of course you will not treat the house the same way. If you are just a temporary caretaker of it, you will try to get as much out of the house in as short a time as possible, because after four or five years, you might no longer be in charge of it, and the house might then be a ruin. Would you do the same thing if you were the owner of the house? And the answer is, that's very unlikely that you would do that. I'm not excluding that. There are sometimes crazy people in the world. Actually, there are very many crazy people in the world. But it is far less likely that people would do that if they own the place. So democracy is a system that leads to systematic capital consumption. That is, people consume in the present because they do not know in what position they will be in the future instead of accumulating capital and making long run, long run plans. There's another thing that I should mention. In democracy, because people are elected, you might say, isn't it better to have competition in who is the ruler than having no competition if you have a king running the country? And the answer here is, no competition is good when it concerns the production of goods, that is, the production of things that people want. But competition is not good when it concerns things that are evil, things that people do not want. People do not ask to be taxed. They will not scream, hey, tax me, tax me, tax me, I love to be taxed. They do not ask, make another law, make another law that benefits you and harms me. They are afraid of this. But since states are in the business of taxing and legislating, that is, doing bad things, doing evil things, competition in that area is bad. You don't want competition in who is the best killer, who is the best person to run a concentration camp. There you would be happy if you have incompetent people, stupid people, people who are inefficient. But democracy precisely produces that the biggest demagogues, the biggest crooks, will rise to the top. Imagine that you would run a campaign and would say, hey, I want private property be, to be protected under all circumstances. I don't want to have any taxes I don't want any redistribution of, uh, of income and wealth and so forth. We have to stop passing any laws except the principles that I mentioned at the very beginning. How successful would you be in a campaign like this? The answer, you will not be very successful. Because democracy, of course, allows people also to use their vote to vote themselves the property of other people. In the history of political thought, you will find practically no one who ever promoted democracy until very recently. But in the past, everybody realized democracy is a way of people who have less or have nothing to vote themselves the property of those people who have more and are better off than they themselves are. It promotes immorality. 
democracy might work in very small villages because there everybody knows who the other people are. You know, Mr. X is a nice guy and Mr. Y is a lousy, lousy person. Um, and you would be ashamed to try to rob other people of their property because people know each other. But if you have states that are made up of millions and millions of people, you don't know whom you rob. Um, so the inhibition that you otherwise have against stealing from other people simply disappears. One word about, yeah, can kings also be evil? Yes, they can be evil. But because they inherit their position, they are not elected to their position, they also might be sometimes nice people. Democratic leaders cannot be nice people because they are the result of elections, of competition among them. All right. So this is the first story, how states evolve and how the structure, the constitution of states has changed uh, in the course of whatever uh, thousand years. Now I come to the second story, which in a way complements the first, makes the picture more complete than the picture that I developed up to this point. In a situation where we have no state, of course there are also fights and warlike activities going on among different groups and so forth, different gangs, different families fighting each other. It was not a situation where everything was absolutely peaceful and wonderful and marvelous. But before the development of the state, whenever you engaged in aggression against other people or some groups fighting other groups, you had to pay the cost of being an aggressor yourself. To aggress against other people is also not costless. You must have means to do it, you must have money to do it, you must have weapons to do it, you must have people who side with you and so forth, and yet you might have to pay to fight on your side. So you would always think, if I go, into some conflict with others, fight other people, I always have to consider how costly will that be for me? Will I win? Will I lose? And so forth. As soon as you have the institution of the state, war making becomes a different enterprise. Because now you can make other people pay for your aggression and your aggressive motives that you have towards other people. Again, recall, you can resort to taxes. People must pay for your war that might not want to have anything to do with it. Imagine that, let's say, Mr. Bush, when he started his wars in the Middle East or so, uh, would have had to pay for this war himself and recruit his bodies and friends and say, uh, are you willing to chip in for this war? Well, he might have found a few people would have chipped in. But would all Americans have said, hey, wonderful, great idea, here you have my money, go ahead, do it. And the answer is, no, millions of people would have said, but what do I have to do with these people in Iraq? What do I have to do with the people in Afghanistan? It's your war, pay for your war, but leave us out of it. So the likelihood of wars 
increases dramatically as soon as you can externalize the cost of it onto people who are actually not interested in that whole thing at all. Now, if states go to war against other states, and they do, they do more likely, as I said, than private people go to warlike activities. Then the question is, of course, who tends to win these wars? And also realize immediately that wars are el eliminative competition between states. That is, on every territory, there can only be one monopolist of taxation and legislation. You cannot have on the same territory different organizations um, that legislate and that tax. Every state on his territory is the only one that can do it. And of course, every state has an interest to expand its territory. The more people he controls, that means the more people he can tax. The more people he can impose his own laws on those people. So then the question comes, who will win these types of wars? Now obviously, very small states will not likely go to war against very big states because they know they will lose it. But assume states of roughly equal size and roughly equal numbers of people. And there we discover some sort of paradox. Obviously, all wars require resources. Weapons, soldiers, ammunition, logistical materials, and so forth. Now, the longer a war draws out, the more important it becomes how wealthy is the society on which this state or that state can draw, get his resources. And the interesting thing is that we discover there is, it is the more liberal states, liberal in the European sense, that is being not quite as nasty as some other states, that those states, of course, command larger resources because more liberal societies are wealthier societies. They allow more capital accumulation. They allow people more to become wealthy and so forth. So there is a tendency that, that might strike you as paradoxical, that the more liberal, the nicer states, so to speak, are those that tend to be the most aggressive, the most imperialistically minded states in the course of history. There's, you have first a country like the Netherlands, for instance, being the first really successful capitalist society that becomes a major colonial power. Then that position goes to England. Again, a very liberal country, a very wealthy country, becoming a world dominating place with places controlled by Britain all around the globe. And then that position is finally inherited by the United States beginning with World War I and culminating with the end of World War II, when the United States, because it is by far the wealthiest country, is also the one that has the largest empire that was ever assembled. Another word about 
war and democracy, you know, the royal wars of kings. The motive for those wars were to a large extent some sort of inheritance disputes with comparatively little involvement of the civilian population. Democratic wars beginning with the French Revolution, and then of course with World War I and World War II, democratic wars are really national wars. They introduce for the first time the draft. That is, since all people allegedly under democracy rule themselves, and it is their state, Everybody has now the obligation to participate in the war. Even the civilian population gets drawn into the war. The war becomes more totalitarian, more total wars than king's wars ever were. King's wars were by and large because the armies were meeting in open, on open fields and the two armies were clashing and the the civilian population was by and large unaffected by it. That, of course, stopped entirely first or with, with the American Civil War, um, then already with, uh, with Napoleon uh, before, uh, with World War I and World War II, of course, all of these states used the draft. All people have to participate in it. Nobody can escape from participating in, uh, in the war enterprise. And you realize that this tendency of uh, states going to war and trying to enlarge their territories would ultimately only come to an end if we have a one world dominating power. It is not necessary that this this is, and of course, this is, so to speak, the goal of the United States. Yes, the United States has something, more than 150 military installations across, across the world, in all sorts of countries. Now they are far away from reaching the position they might never reach it. But it is important to recognize that there is a tendency in that direction. So this is the... The second, the second story that concerns the centralization of state power with, as we can easily imagine, with the logical end point of having a world state, a world government. And let me just make one Point, I'll come back to that later on again. While there are some people who think that this would be, even some philosophers thought, that would be the perfect situation if we have just one world state. It's a big mistake to think that. Because if you have one world state, then you would have the same tax structure and the same legislation, the same regulation structure all across the globe with almost no possibility of people voting with their feet, of running away from a place in search of something that is better. And since people cannot run away from it, this one world state would have, the would have practically no problems anymore on cracking down more and more on their own population because after all, they have no alternatives. They have to stay where they are. And all places are taxed and regulated in the same way. Now I come to the third, third part of the story, which again runs parallel to the ones that I already talked about up until now, 
and complete the picture. And that concerns the development of money. Money emerges in the market as a result of the division of labor in which people engage. Money is defined as a common means of exchange. That is, it is the most easily saleable and the most widely accepted good of all goods to facilitate exchange. There's no other good that is accepted by as many people as easily as money. And there's no other good that can be sold as easily as, as money. Originally, money is a commodity. Some real good that has taken on this function of being the most easily exchangeable of all goods. Of course, states immediately discovered that it would be of utmost importance for them that is, to increase the power and the mightiness of states to somehow get their hands on money. Now, how did they do this? The first thing is they monopolized the minting of, of gold coins and silver coins or whatever was in use. And by monopolizing it, it is only I in this territory can produce gold coins or silver coins. By monopolizing it, they then did what is called coin clipping. They simply said, send me your, send me your coins and I'll make a new picture on the, uh, on the coins uh, the new king, new picture, uh, and then uh, took some of the gold content and silver content out of it, gave the same number of coins back to the people, but what they took out, the gold that they took out, or the silver that they took out, out of each one of these coins, were additional amounts of money that they kept for themselves. So the purchasing power of money was reduced and the government, the states, produced money by stealing from the existing coins. Now people eventually discover this sort of stuff. The next step was, because people don't always schlep around gold coins and silver coins, there existed also something that is called money substitutes. That is, tickets that entitled you to a certain amount of money. Well, were easier to carry around, it's just pieces, uh, tickets. Um, you don't have to have your pockets full of heavy gold coins or so, just tickets, but uh, the, the tickets were titles to gold coins or silver coins. So then they monopolized uh, the issue of tickets. At the beginning, various banks and so forth issued their own tickets. Um, and each of these banks then saw to it whenever you presented a ticket and they had the gold or silver to which the tickets entitled you. So now the tickets are monopolized. Only government-issued tickets can be used in order to be redeemed into gold and, um, and silver coins. And the next step in this process was you have to get rid of gold coins entirely and only do with tickets. Now this process is, has been somewhat complicated and I will not go into all the details how this process happened. But all states typically went 
at some point, usually during wartime, off the gold standard or off the silver standard, and said, look, we keep all the gold, you give us all the gold, you give us all the silver, if you don't do that, we will punish you, and you get tickets for it. But we will no longer redeem these tickets into gold or silver. Again, this was a lengthy process that ended in 1971. In 1971, the last tie to gold was cut. Until 1971, it was possible for, at least for foreign central banks, to come to the United States and say, here I have 35, here I have paper dollars, 30, 35 of them, they entitle me to an ounce of gold. But the United States had printed so many paper tickets, so many paper dollars, that they were incapable of paying gold out according to the agreement that they had made. And it was President Nixon in the United States who in 1971 said, we are off the gold standard completely. From now on, you can keep your paper tickets and, um, and we keep the gold. You realize that once you are in this position where there is absolutely no tie to any commodity anymore, then you can increase the amount of money at will. Nowadays, you can even buy, just press a button and double, triple, quadruple the amount of money in existence. Obviously, you cannot do that if, if you are on a gold or on a silver standard. Now, <laughs> what is important to realize here is an increase in the amount of money in existence does not make society richer. It just reduces the purchasing power of each unit of money. If by printing up paper money you could make society better off, then ask yourself, why is there still a poor country in the world? Even the craziest countries in the world can print any amount of paper money that they want. Why is there still a poor person on earth if simply by increasing the amount of money in existence, wealth would be created? And the answer is, that cannot be done. But if you ask any central banker in the world, they all believe in this nonsense. You read in the paper every day, it's like quantitative easing. That means nothing else but more money will be printed and the purchasing power of each unit will decrease. But by printing money, while you cannot make society as a whole richer, what you can do is you can make those people richer who get the money first. Because those people who get the money first can still buy with that new money at the old low prices and then as that money ripples through the economy and prices go up, those people who then get the money very late, they are paying higher prices already for everything. So there is an income redistribution taking place from those who get the money first, who are the, the ones who benefit from it, and harmed are those people who get the money last. Those people, for instance, who are on fixed incomes. If you are on fixed income and the purchasing power of money declines, you are then screwed. And then the answer is, who is the one who always gets the money first? And the answer is, you know, who gets the money first? First the central bank that printed it. 
and they are governmental institutions. And then the main clients of the central banks, those are the big private banks. And then the main clients of these private banks. But none of that is you and me. So if people somehow complain about how oh, the inequality of incomes is always rising, one major reason for this is precisely this constant increase in the amount of money in existence. Now, bringing the story to an end, here and money again leads us back to what I talked before about war and imperialism. The most powerful country is also the one that produces what is called the reserve currency. The US dollar is the reserve currency used by almost all countries. The Americans printing dollars and dollars and dollars and the other countries who sell goods to the United States, earning dollars, don't always just use these dollars in order to buy or invest things in the United States. They keep it as reserves, as a basis of their own currencies. Foreigners who sell things to the United States are paid with paper, so to speak, and the Americans receive actual goods. So American consumption is to a large extent financed by people in other, in other countries, which is, which we might call monetary imperialism. Again, currently, there is still one problem even for the Americans. That is, the dollar is not the only paper currency in the world. There still exist other currencies, Euro, Japanese Yen, Russian Ruble. Um, and if the Americans would overdo it with their money printing, then the danger might be that people move to other currencies. So there is then a tendency to eliminate also this competition against other currencies. And one attempt, for instance, one big step in that direction was, for instance, the establishment of the euro. Before the euro was established, around 2000, there were still other competing strong currencies, like the German mark, for instance. The German mark was not particularly strong because any German virtues, but Germany had suffered twice from hyperinflation because they lost the war twice. And because of that experience, the Germans were a little bit more aware of the fact that of inflation, that inflation is a danger. And because of that, the German Central Bank was relatively modest in its amount of mark printing. The Americans did not like that and established, promoted the establishment of the European Central Bank. And the European Central Bank, there you have uh, Spaniards, Italians, uh, Greek people sitting and on the board of, of the European Central Bank. And all these countries are, were easy money countries. So the euro is a far weaker currency than the German mark was before. And the best, from the point of view of American interests, would be, of course, if the entire world would go on a dollar standard. Now, again, as I said, there is this tendency toward a world government, and there is a tendency to establish a world paper currency. 
A world paper currency would be, of course, a currency that would be more inflationary than anything you have ever seen before. Because you would not have to be afraid that, because there's only one currency left, that it somehow falls in value against other currencies which uh, curtail your own temptation to print more and more and more. So I'm also not sure that there will eventually come about this one world paper currency, just as I'm not sure that there will in the end come about a world state. But one must be aware in order to understand the current world that these two tendencies are underway. That they are constantly forces, influential forces, that work in this, in this direction. What I have told you so far has a certain amount of similarity with the Marxist theory of social development of, and of history. I realize that you're mostly relatively young people, so you might not even be uh, well versed in, uh, in Marxist theory anymore. I am much older than you. Uh, I'm, I just turned 70 this year. Um, I had first-hand experience of communism. My mother had been expropriated in, in East Germany by the Russians. Uh, I was born in West Germany, but most of my relatives lived in the, in the East. So I have seen firsthand the mess that uh, socialism caused, the uh, desperate impoverishment of of people, and I have, of course, studied. I was a lefty when I was young. Um, I have studied Marxist theory. I probably know more about Marxist theory than most or any of you. Um, I want to make you aware of a certain similarity of what I said to what the Marxists said and point out what their major mistake was. The Marxist theory is also something, there is exploitation going on. The exploitation is exploitation by the capitalists, they exploit the workers. Now, there existed an exploitation theory and a class theory long before Marx. It was a liberal or Austrian uh, exploitation and, uh, uh, and um, exploitation theory. That is, the state are the exploiting organizations. Taxation is exploitation. The interests of the worker and the capitalist are harmonious. The better the company goes, the higher the wages of workers will become. It is a voluntary association. If a worker doesn't want to work for them, he doesn't have to work for them. But there is exploitation in the world. Exploitation is taxation. And then the Marxists, that there is a concentration of firms. That firms become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until there's only one global firm left, so to speak. Yeah, but it is not firms that get bigger and bigger and bigger. It is, States get bigger and bigger. The concentration does take place, but it is not the concentration of private companies. It is the concentration of states to ever larger size. So what then can we hope for? What we can hope for is for a process of decentralization, of ever smaller units on the way to a society without a state completely. That is, the European Union is a disaster. The Brexit was a good idea. Germany should get out. The provinces in Germany should get out. Um, in many speeches in Europe, I have always, 
I have coined, so to speak, this, the phrase, what we need is a Europe of thousand Liechtensteins. Liechtenstein has 36,000 inhabitants. In Liechtenstein, the Prince of Liechtenstein allows these six or seven villages which compose Liechtenstein to each secede from Liechtenstein to become independent of Liechtenstein or to join Austria or to join Switzerland, whatever they want. Why would that be good? Why should we promote the secessionist movements or decentralization? Because if we have states at all, and as long as we have any states at all, it is best to have as many of them as possible because then they have to compete for people to stay there and not move to other places. They have to treat their people in a nice way, otherwise they simply disappear. Small states are also less likely to engage in warlike activities. Small states also are almost forced to engage in free trade with the rest of the world. Because imagine that a state like Liechtenstein with 36,000 people would say, we do protectionist measures. We don't want any foreign goods come in here. Um, the population would be dead in, in a week or two. They must engage in free trade. On the other hand, if you have a huge state like the United States, if they say, okay, we build, so to speak, uh, a trade wall all around the United States. It would, of course, lower their standards of living, but not as dramatically and not as immediately as in small places, because they still have a large internal market with thousands and millions of, of firms within the territory of the United States that can produce almost everything, maybe not as efficient and not as quickly and not as good as the products would be if they would also uh, trade with the rest of the world. But they could, they could deal with it for a while. And as I said before, in small, the smaller the states are, the more difficult it becomes for people to simply engage in I steal from my neighbor by voting for this and that because people know each other and there will be more social, social control. So the goal of libertarians on the way to the goal of a completely stateless society is first we have to work as hard as we can with as good arguments as we can come up with for, the pro, for a process of decentralization or even, even the session. I thank you very much. Да, спасибо вам большое. Сейчас я а, скажу небольшую свою реплику. А, 
Я расскажу вам, значит, зачем существует философия и почему ей нужно интересоваться и как неправильно относиться. Зачем существует либертарианская теория и, и что а, значат те постулаты, те тезисы, к которым мы а, стремимся. Вот а, Ганс а, Герман Хоппе только что рассказал вам об либертарианском идеале. Он объяснил, что либертарианский идеал заключается в децентрализации не в какой-то конкретной версии общества, а в том, чтобы у человека был выбор между тем, какое общество отвечает его интересам, потому что только через выбор человек раскрепощается. Невозможно придумать универсальную ценность, невозможно придумать универсальную ценность, которая бы раскрепостила человека. В этом э, червоточина классического либерализма, в этом проблема, которая вылилась э, в э, вырождение либерализма в Европе, вырождение либерализма на Западе, потому что человек освобождается только через выбор, и именно выбор либертарианцы хотят защитить. Но для чего существует существует философия, что нам говорит. Когда либертарианцы утверждают ту или иную ценность, например, они утверждают ценность децентрализации, ценность цецессии, ценность а, абсолютной свободы, общество без государства, мы совершенно не имеем в виду, что завтра, завтра государство нужно полностью упразднить. Мы совершенно не имеем в виду, что а, вот эта вот идеология, которая существует в мире идей и в вакууме идей, а, как все остальные идеи, да, что их можно завтра же приниметь практически, что их можно завтра же превратить в политическую программу, и тут-то, тут-то человек освободится, тут-то Россия станет свободной. Это не совсем так. Иде идеология, да, и идеология либертарианства называется анархокапитализм. Идеология либертарианства – это наша путеводная звезда, это компас, компас, который показывает правильное направление. Ага, свобода туда. И для того, чтобы у вас был точный компас, он должен давать точные, независящие от условий, независящие от условий а, ответы. Но по, если вы будете идти по дороге и смотреть только на компас и не будете глядеть под ноги, вы очень быстро убедитесь, что вы бы либо пойдете под машину, либо выпадете из окна. Потому что помимо идеал, мира идей существует мир, данный нам в ощущениях, существует политика. И политическое либертарианство. Политическое либертарианство называется минархизм. Это то, что происходит, когда мы помимо нашей идеологии начинаем ориентироваться на условия, в которые мы поставлены, когда мы начинаем ориентироваться, когда мы начинаем считаться. С теми, с теми законами, которые нам диктует общество. Потому что, игнорируя их, мы никогда не подвинем общество в сторону свободы, в сторону той децентрализации, про которую рассказывал сегодня профессор. И анархокапитализм и минархизм – это две стороны одной медали. Анархокапитализм – это наша идеология, минархизм – это практика нашей идеологии, политическая практика нашей идеологии, и они складываются в одну медаль в одну медаль либертарианства. Вот я вам сегодня говорю, что анархокапиталистический идеал – недостижим. Совершенного нет в живой природе. Он существует для того, чтобы давать нам правильные ответы, идеологические ответы, для того, чтобы показывать нам направление в сторону свободы. Но от того, что этот идеал недостижим, совершенно не следует, что мы не должны стремиться только в сторону этого идеала, только в сторону свободы, только в сторону раскрепощения человека. Одна из самых ценных вещей – которую я прочитал в книге доктора Хоппе «Демократия неизверг... неизвергнутый Бог», это мысль о том, что бороться нужно не за власть, бороться, бороться нужно против власти, нужно бороться против инструментов централизации, которые превращают Россию в ту тюрьму народов, которой она была на протяжении столетий. Ведь тюрьма народов – это не какое-то красивое выражение. За ним с фразой стоит очень конкретный смысл. Когда мы говорим, что Россия тюрьма народов, мы имеем в виду, что вот гиперцентрализация вот привела к тому, что в законы пишутся политиками не для нас, а для себя. Потому что люди, находящиеся у червячков власти, не подотчетны гражданскому обществу. И даже если бы они были подотчетными, давайте, давайте проведем вот этот вот мысленный эксперимент. Давайте на секунду представим, что действительно к власти пришел святой человек. Давайте представим на секундочку. Человек, который готов самоотверженно жертвовать своими интересами для того, чтобы, для того, чтобы сделать Россию лучше. Получится ли это у него? Разумеется, не получится. Потому что там, где существует централизованная власть, даже руководствуясь самыми лучшими побуждениями, невозможно написать такие законы, которые бы подходили всем. Потому что не существует таких законов, 
которые бы в равной степени приходили москвичам, калининградцам, чеченцам, ингушам, башкирам, якутам, да? Сколько народов живет в нашей стране? Такого закона не существует. И к чему мы в итоге приходим? Мы приходим к тому, что в России пишутся законы, которые в равной степени не подходят никому. И мы, борясь за свое будущее, борясь за то, что власть попадет в руки нашим врагам, а мы именно это имеем в виду по централизации, власть подойдет в руки нашим врагам, боремся за железный трон. Я приводил раньше пример с кольцом всевластия, да? Ну, я думаю, вы все смотрели а, сериал «Игру престолов», и вы знаете, что прекратить войну можно... Невозможно победить в войне, захватив железный трон. Победить в войне можно только его уничтожив. И именно за это борются либертарианцы. Мы боремся, чтобы централизованной политической власти не существовало. И это можно добиться в рамках границах одной страны, и именно это подходит России ровно потому, что Россия такая великая и огромная страна, и чтобы сохранить ее величие, чтобы сохранить нашу с вами свободу, мы должны бороться за то, чтобы в нашей жизни впервые и наконец начала зависеть от нас, чтобы законы писались не в Кремле, а писались, вот москвичам это немножко сложнее понять, я сейчас специально приехал из-за тура по России, где эта мысль понятна каждому, может быть, она будет понятна вам, если вы немножко абстрагируетесь от того, что мы живем под стенами Кремля. Сегодня в России законы пишутся в интересах чиновников. Написать их как-то иначе невозможно. И находясь в Москве, находясь в Москве, у нас, по крайней мере, под боком есть какие-то органы власти, до которым, по крайней мере, мы можем иногда выйти, выйти помитинговать, когда нам это разрешают. Но остальная страна, остальная страна лишена этой привилегии. И доктор Хоппа сегодня много говорил про привилегии. Он говорил, что государство – это источник привилегий, это то, что приводит к социальному расслоению, потому что только с помощью государственных инструментов принуждения можно создать привилегированную группу людей. И эта привилегированная группа кристаллизовалась в царское время, кристаллизовалась в советское время и продолжает существовать, существовать сегодня, здесь и сейчас. Поэтому, когда вы мечтаете о прекрасной России будущего, когда вы думаете о том, как России помочь и как помочь русскому человеку, вы должны себе отдавать отчет, что для русского человека не существует большей опасности, чем сильное централизованное государство. И тезис, который я очень часто произношу на своих лекциях, вот я уже говорил, да, что Россия, Россия это тюрьма народов, а, и у правых у них есть очень справедливый тезис. А, у них есть тезис о том, что в России, Россия это антирусское государство, и действительно, они совершенно правы, вы, вы совершенно правы, Россия. Антирусское государство, а еще Россия это антипашкирское государство, это античеченское государство, эти антиякутское государство, потому что оно не обслуживает интересы ни одного из живущих на нашей, в нашей стране народов. И у правых есть еще, еще один достойный тезис. Когда Советский Союз развалился, то Ельцин выдумал такое омерзительное, действительно омерзительное слово «россияне». Знаете это слово, да? Вот что такое россияне? Это на самом деле гомункул советского человека. Когда советский человек не получился, от него остался гомункул. Но снова, и это очень важно, в россиян перемалывают не только русских, в россиян перемалывают все народы, живущие на нашей территории. И пока мы не осознаем, что бороться нам нужно именно против этой государственной мясорубки, а не друг с другом, нас таки в итоге обязательно в россиян перемолят. Поэтому, поэтому я еще раз напоминаю, бороться нужно не за власть. Бороться нужно против власти. Нужно бороться за свою страну и нужно бороться за свой народ. А людей, которые все это уничтожают, нужно ненавидеть и им сопротивляться. Потому что если мы сопротивляться не будем, мы, как и другие великие культуры и великие народы, исчезнем с листа земли. Помните, была такая великая римская культура, да? великий язык, великая, э, великая культура, великое искусство. Э, у них были боги, которым они молились, у них была традиции, которые они мечтали передать своим потомкам. А что, что стало с римлянами? Что стало с римлянами? Сноска в учебнике истории. Там теперь живут варвары. Был великий Египет, великая культура, великий язык. Дали нам геом... дали... Египтяне дали нам геометрию. А кто, кто сегодня живет в Египте? Арабы, совершенно верно. А что стало с египтянами? 
сноска в учебнике истории. Был великий Вавилон, у них тоже были боги, которым они молились, у них была культура, которая казалась их важным. Что стало с вавилонянами? Сноска в учебнике истории. А кто прошел? Это очень важно. Кто прошел? Сквозь тысячелетия не задет. Кто сохранил своих богов, свои ценности, свой язык, свою культуру? Кто сегодня донес до, до сегодняшнего дня свою культуру неизменной? И почему? Разумеется, это были евреи. А почему? Почему им это удалось? Потому что они всегда были гонимы. Они были гонимы в Египте, они были гонимы в Вавилоне, они были гонимы в Риме. И никогда не связывали выживание своей культуры с выживанием государства. И именно поэтому государство не похоронило их под своими обломками. Поэтому, если вам, если вам дорого, дорог, дороги ваши традиции, если вы любите свой язык, если вы любите свою страну, если вы дорожите своей культурой, вы не имеете права доверять это богатство государству, потому что если вы ему доверитесь, государство все это похоронит. Становитесь либертарианцами. На этом все. Теперь можете расходиться. Спасибо.